Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens with all their host, the earth with all its plenty, and the sea and all that fills it. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Grace and peace be unto you from the one who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here on this afternoon to praise God, to give witness to our faith, and to give thanks for the life of John Richard Philippi. We come together in grief, acknowledging our loss. May God grant to us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. For dying, Christ destroyed our death, and in rising, Christ restores our life. In baptism, John was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. I invite you to join me if you are able and rise to give witness to our faith in this God who is always with us, singing together hymn number 210, 210 stanzas 1 and 2. seated. Let us pray. O oh God, you are our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. You are the one who has created this cosmos. You are our refuge and our strength a helper close at hand in times of distress. You forgive what we have done and what we have left undone. Your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Help us to so hear the words of scripture, the stories of sustenance, that our loneliness may be eased, our hope lightened, May your spirit assure us of your presence so that we may abide amidst this heartache in the healing balm of your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil 
for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This time we hear the remembrances of Dick's children. Hi, I'm Jennifer, the oldest of Dick's children, if you don't know me, and the favorite. <laughs> First, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out here today and for supporting my mom and myself and the rest of my family during this journey. And in the last couple of months since my dad's passing, it has meant so much to all of us. I think everybody here who knew my dad probably knows him in a different way. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way that I knew him. To begin with, he was incredibly kind and generous and loyal. He was very hardworking and he was funny. He had a sarcastic, dry sense of humor that somehow got passed on to all three of his children. And I think if you had to pick a sport that was my dad's favorite, it was probably picking on me. Teasing me was one of his favorite things to do. So a couple of stories that, when I think about my dad, are really the strongest memories that I have are when he teased me. I remember calling home one time and I asked for my mother, and he said that she was out at the store. And I said, okay. And so we talked for a few minutes, and he said, can you hang on one second? And I said, sure. And there were about three minutes of silence. And then my mom picked up the phone, and she said, hello? And I said, mom? And she said, what is going on? I said, I was just talking to dad. He put me on hold. She goes, what are you talking about? Dad's not even here. I just walked in the door and the phone is on the floor next to the dog. So <laughs> my dad had clearly been tired of that conversation and just got up and walked out. <laughs> he also used to tease me. He was very strict when I was growing up, which is probably hard for some people to believe. It wasn't until later that I learned that he was strict because his experience taught him exactly what can happen. So when I went to college, I rebelled a little bit. And there were a couple of semesters where he received a letter from the dean regarding alcohol that had been in my room when I was underage. And so his favorite joke was that I made the dean's list every semester, just the wrong one. <laughs> one thing that I think everybody probably knows about my dad is how much he adored my mother. He loved her so much. I rarely ever saw my parents argue. He thought that everything she did was so funny. Now, if you know my mom, she is an incredibly smart woman, but she does things that sometimes leave you questioning what just happened. And my dad would just laugh and laugh. I mean, she had a lead foot, and it was like there were, still does, there were cops constantly flagging her down, giving her tickets. She would hide them. My dad would discover them, or John would talk about them when he was little, and he would just laugh. He just thought she was great. I called home from college one time, and I got the answering machine. 
and my mom's voice was on the message, and it said, hi, we're not home right now. If this is the cable man, I left the door unlocked. <laughs> Let yourself in. The French exchange student is sleeping upstairs in the bedroom. So I called my dad and I said, you need to call home. So he called home and then he called me back and he was just laughing and laughing. And he thought it was so funny whenever I walked into a room when I was in high school, if him and my mom, if he and my mom were in there talking, he would grab her and start kissing her because it would just make me want to vomit when I was 16 years old. And he just thought that was the best. He adored you, Mom. When my mom wanted a new kitchen, which turned into a big renovation. Now, my mom is not someone who cooks every night. My father said, sure, you want that kitchen, I will give you that kitchen. And after a microwave in the fridge in the dining room for about a year, the kitchen was finally completed. And one Saturday, my dad had to go into the office and he said to my mom, they were upstairs in their bedroom, he said, what are you gonna do when I go into work? She goes, actually, I wanna do a lot of baking today. I'm so excited about my new kitchen. I just have a lot of things I wanna do in there. And my dad said, great. And he goes to work. He came home like four or five hours later. He walked upstairs, my mom was in the bedroom. He said, what'd you do today? And she said, I baked, I, I put a lot of stuff in the freezer. He said, really, can you come with me for a second? And he took my mom downstairs to that kitchen, and before he had left for the office that morning, he ate four bananas and stuck the banana peels hanging from the cabinets. So had my mom been in that kitchen, she would have known. <laughs> and the jig was up, and he just laughed. He loved to tell the stories. My brothers have amazing partners and my dad adored them and got to know them. They have amazing children, as do I. <laughs> I got engaged in January to an incredibly wonderful man. And thankfully, my dad got to spend a lot of time with him over the last year and a half, two years. And even though my dad was sick, I really believe my dad knew that this was a wonderful man. And so my dad had spent his life protecting me and my brothers, and now he knew that we were all safe. And that's the terrible thing about Alzheimer's, right? Nobody comes back from Alzheimer's. They don't come and say, hey, this was, this was what was going through my mind when I was sick. But I believe that my dad was aware of everything. He just couldn't express it. And all he wanted to do was protect the people that he loved. My boys are kind. My nephews and nieces are kind. They are loyal. They are all funny. And I can't wait to watch them grow up and see as more of my dad comes through in them. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm John Phillippe, and I too am my dad's favorite child. <laughs> he adored his children. <laughs> I'm sorry, this may take a little while. <laughs> There's this particular photo of me and my dad. And on the night of January 31st, our son, my wife Jen, and my son Jack did something we'd never seen him do before. He climbed into this tight spot behind our couch and went over to the photo. 
I just started smiling and laughing. And just a few hours later, Dad died. Jack's full name is John Richard Philippi III. And we could not be more proud than to honor my dad by naming him that. And what's more, they share a birthday, April 10th. And what better gift could he have given me, his son, than in the final hours of his full and beautiful life to make my son smile and laugh? just like he did for so many people over the years. Is this, it's as if he knew how much his grandfather, Baba, loved him, how good a man he was, and of course, how funny he was. And I see a lot of my dad and Jack. I mean, literally, he looks a lot like him. And how many two-year-olds do you know whose favorite TV channel is CNBC? It's true. (laughs) And that's not something that skipped a generation either. He goes up and he goes up and looks at the ticker. And it reminds me of being in my dad's old Merrill Lynch office, looking at the overhead ticker obsessively for some reason when I was a toddler. And he and his colleagues would try to get me to stop. John Pearson, I think, finally bribed me with some candy. And I loved going to his office with him. And while I didn't go into that particular field, Jen did. And Dad was so proud to have her join him at RBC. Of course, most of his career was at Tucker Anthony namesake of the dog we used to have, Tucker, who loved to greet Dad when he got home from work and to lick his sweaty legs when he returned from his many bike rides. And my dad loved it too. But to go back to that, to go back to that picture, there are so many things about my dad that it stands for. It's a photo of us at the Frozen Four. It's not a movie sequel. There's probably a Frozen Four movie, but (laughs) this was um, the college hockey championships. And that night was the semifinal. (laughs) And it was, it was April 10th. So, of course, that photo reminds me of our weekend together, watching Union win the national championship. Beating BC that night, Jen. Um, <laughs> before, before beating Minnesota, where my wife's from, and I know her dad was disappointed in, in that outcome, probably not knowing how much uh, her, Jen's boyfriend at the time, my wife Jen, not my sister, was was invested in it, and she Jen was invested in it too. Um, and I'm not sure she enjoyed all the Friday and Saturday nights listening to hockey games being streamed over the internet <laughs> in our condo. Um, but they were they were good memories, and it led to to my dad and I having just a really meaningful time together. And we have many wonderful times together. Skiing, usually at Bromley. And the last time he ever went ski- <laughs> skiing was with, with me and my wife. The first time they ever skied together, and it was wonderful. And it was closing day at Bromley, and it was a, just a beautiful, gorgeous, sunny day, and it was such a happy memory. <laughs> Other good times, body surfing at Stone Harbor, our trip out west together, playing sports in the backyard. When I when I was little, we used to box on his bed. I always said I was Muhammad Ali, and he'd say he was some boxer I'd never heard of, like Robert Redford or Burt Baccarat. (laughs) They were always outmatched. And Union football games on Saturday afternoon, especially playoff games, we drove to together to watch Union beat Norwich in the freezing rain 
or lose in heartbreaking fashion yet again to Ithaca. He taught me a lot, a lot of the important things in life. But also, you know, to ride a bike, to tie a tie, to build a fire. And I will say, nobody builds fires as well as, as my dad did. And when I see a good fire, it always reminds me of him. And we were in Indian Guides together. And I'm sorry, I can't see everyone who's here. And some, some of you were probably in the Comanche tribe with us. Now, as you might guess, it's not called Indian Guides anymore. Um, and I doubt they, <laughs> they wear the uh, Indian clothing that, that we wore. But we had some amazing father-son experiences. Although, if I'm being honest, we probably weren't as good at the arts and crafts as maybe some of the others. And we had a motto in Indian Guides, pals forever. And it was true. And speaking of names that can't be used anymore, mom's like, where is he going with this? They, they probably don't have pro wrestlers named things like the Wild Samoans or Iron Sheik these days. But when I was a kid, I guess it was okay. And what a thrill for me when my dad, for my birthday, took me and Jamie and Justin Bendel to see, to see them wrestle at the RPI Fieldhouse, a gift made even better when the Iron Sheik was crushed by that great American hero, Sergeant Slaughter. <laughs> and there were other, other somewhat ridiculous things he did for us because it was our birthday. We'd always get to choose dinner, and I somewhat weirdly always wanted flank steak, which he found amusing. Although, even weirder perhaps, Jeff would want Roy Rogers. So dad would drive out to the rest stop on the throughway to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> it was typical, he did so many things big and small for his family because nothing was more important to him. And that photo represents that. And union itself was so much of my dad's life. Well after his days of carousing as a brother at Sayu, he was a big supporter of the college, and he used to love to swim and go to the gym, and he loved taking me with him when I was in town. And he hung on to that, even after the Alzheimer's was taking his toll, and maybe his workouts weren't quite as intense at the end, and he'd do a little lifting and kind of walk to another machine and you know, not really do a whole lot, but sort of go from machine to machine. And as, as my wife, Jen, pointed out, well, that's what a lot of guys just do at the gym anyway. And so, <laughs> so I think she was right. And he, and he hung on to so much of what he loved, um, you know, until the end. And maybe the jokes weren't as quite as funny, but the humor was there. And so was the love. And we could see it. And as most of us here know, Union College is very much part of the community in which it sits, which is also fitting because Dad was so dedicated to serving this Schenectady community. Boys and Girls Club Community College, so much more, and to this church where we are today to remember and celebrate him. But he was so quiet and had so much humility. I even learned things about him just in these last couple months. And as I think about the picture, that picture, and so many different memories, I even remember pictures he used to give our grandmother for Christmas. They were photos of himself taken in a photo booth. Merry Christmas, Cynthia. Here's your son-in-law making really weird faces or with his finger up his nose. <laughs> that was his sense of humor. His sense of humor on Christmas also meant leaving the price tags on the gifts, but putting a one in front of the, in front of the price so the $20 gift became $120. And maybe that gift didn't cost $120, but nobody could doubt his generosity. Back to Grandma. Many of you know Grandma. She's not exactly a shrinking violet. Dad teased her a lot, maybe as much as he teased Jen. Um, but he adored her. And I kind of feel like she should be up here speaking because she eulogized him so well Grandma, when we spoke the night after Dad died, she said he was a true gentleman. She'll never forget the day that Mom brought him home to her and Uncle Bob. She reminded us today how it was just at the right time in their life. 
she said what a devoted father and what a devoted husband he was. And we know it, and Mom, I know you know it. Grandma also said she never heard an unkind word about Dad. And I believe it because I don't think I did either. When I'd get introduced as Dick Phillippe's son, it always made me very proud, and people would always tell me how highly they thought of him. And so many of you sent so many kind words that I think describe him so well that we received over these last few months. Compassion, humor, leadership, hard work, mentor, gentleman, kind, empathetic, genuine. I could keep going, but if you're, if you're here, you already know. And thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of our life, part of my dad's life. And finally, I started with our son, Jack, and we now also have a baby daughter, Catherine, Kate, dad's final grandchild, we hope. <laughs> she was born just a few weeks after we lost dad, so they never got to meet each other. But she will know him and love him, just like we know and love his dad, who we never met and his grandchildren, all of whom he loved so much and who adored, adore him, will be the most precious of his many wonderful legacies. And we will do our best to have them grow up to be like Baba. Dad, I know you're looking after us. I'm still rooting for union. Let's go you. And still making people laugh. But I miss you terribly. I love you deeply. Pals forever. Thanks, John. That was really well written. I can't believe you wrote all that today. <laughs> Um, friends, again, thank you for being here. I'm Jeff. I'm his third child, and, well, I'm not going to even go there. <laughs> but I want to share a story about how my mom and dad met, and, well, how they really met. They met on the tennis court, and that was awkward, but later on, they met in a bar. And it was during the college years, so that's not a surprise, but it was in a bar in Saratoga, and my mom was tending bar. And my dad was, of course, going to Union. And he wanted to go up and meet the girls from, from Skids. So he went up to uh, Saratoga, and, and he couldn't resist just going up and ordering his, I don't know, maybe his sixth or seventh drink of the night when he saw my mom behind the bar. And amazingly, during that order, he got her name, he flirted a bit, and he somehow convinced her to go on a date that very evening when she was going to clock out. So he proceeded back and leaned against the wall and proceeded to pass out right there and then. But he sobered up, and they went out to a bar, another bar. And they sat next to a couple, and my dad just started sharing stories about his wartime in Vietnam, all the injuries he sustained out there, and how he came back and was working full-time at the Y, and he used his day's wage to pay for his taxi to get up to Saratoga that day so he could go on the date with my mom. She looked at him like, what she didn't realize, she was drawing upon all the emotions of the people around him and getting free drinks the entire night. <laughs> So that wasn't actually the plan, just to get free drinks. His plan was to woo her, to woo her into another date and go down to New York City and meet his parents. And it happened the very next day. <laughs> and looking back, I think, that was my dad? Wow, he had some game. <laughs> he sure did. And I really didn't realize how deep and loving their relationship was until I moved back here three years ago with my family, with Daniela and Dylan 
and we spent several months here with mom and dad. I don't. <laughs> and then I was working. I was working in Alaska, coming back and forth, leading trips. And Daniela sent me an email. And I remember it to this day, the exact words. And I'll say it to you in English. She said, "Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your family and your parents with me. Never before in my life." Have I met a couple that loves each other so much? It's really amazing to see, and it's the most beautiful thing in the world, the way they treat each other, the way your dad, despite his condition, still looks after her and gets anxious when she's away for a long time, and the way they even flirt in the kitchen, which I never saw, but apparently it happened. She said that it changed her life, and it made me realize how lucky I was. To grow up in a household with so much love, so much love, and although it was the start, the joking start of the relationship about his service and the community, it actually evolved to a real thing, and their their relationship was based on that. And my brother mentioned it, how committed he was to the community here. But what amazes me most is not just the work he did, but how he did it. And he didn't care for recognition. Harry, Harry S. Truman once said, "It's amazing what you can do when no one cares about getting the credit. It's amazing what you can do when no one cares about getting the credit." And my father was a living example of that, and that's what I admire most of him. And it's certainly impacted that that philosophy has impacted my life and my career. And I will always look up to him for that. He was a man of many passions, as they said. He loved to give, really, the women in our family a hard time. My mom, my grandma, and Aunt Sue even too. There's Aunt Sue over there. He, the things he used to say. Oh my gosh, I would say them all, but we're in church. <laughs> he got a kick out of it.、Um, and he had other great passions. It wasn't just buying Christmas gifts at the dollar store. It was a passion for eating little Debbie snacks. He shared that with me. Dylan, we'll have to get some little Debbies today to honor Baba. He had a passion for endurance sports. You know, when he was in high school, he trained on the cross country team with Frank Shorter, who went on to become the Olympic champion in the marathon. And my dad, although he didn't run in college, he was a bit distracted by his fraternity. He self-trained, and on the Union College track right here, he ran a 4:20 mile all by himself. It's pretty amazing to do that by yourself. He was probably hungover too. <laughs> so he was a great man, a really, really fun. And his endurance sports became a passion later on in his life. It resurfaced when he was in his 40s, and he became a elite master swimmer. Who does that? He also ran 100-mile bike rides on the weekends, and, and he wasn't flashy, and he didn't boast about it. In fact, he wore his old gym shoes and, and knee-high dress socks that he probably wore in the office the day prior, and his old bike. And he'd just go out for a 100-mile bike ride, and he didn't even tell anyone about it. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> so. He would, because he was so modest, he would probably have felt. A little bit awkward about you all coming here from afar to celebrate him, just him. He'd say, "Come on," but I think he would take great delight in knowing that today was also a mini family family reunion of sorts. It's the first time we've all been together in over a year, and just this morning we got to hug and kiss baby Kate, our new niece who was born just a couple months ago. And I got the best hug from Griffin and Chase ever today at the cemetery. And I think Baba would have loved that—that that we all came here and gave these great hugs, and we came here and were together because of him. So, to his grandchildren, Griffin, Chase, Dylan, Cynthia, Jack, and Kate, I want to give you the same message that he gave to us. 30 years ago, in this same church, when he spoke at his mom's funeral, 
and he said it to me, and now he's saying it to you. Even though it was really hard to say it in the last few years, I want you to know that I love you, and I always will, and I'm proud of you. And we love you too, Baba. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Jennifer and John and Jeffrey, for sharing. There will be an extended time for sharing and fellowship following this service in our Covenant Hall, and encourage you to, uh, to not only greet the family there, but to share in the stories the way in which Dick's life was a blessing to you with one another and with their family. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Dick Philippi was one who knew this church well and who loved it and served it remarkably over his years. Primarily on the finance committee, if recollection serves right. We have members of the finance committee who are elders with us in the front pew this morning who know of his service. Dick was one who, as his family has recalled, was was always humble, always quiet. Cindy did the talking when I greeted them at the door. (laughs) But always appreciative. I had no idea that he was such an athlete, such a biker, such a swimmer, um, and I'm duly impressed and delighted myself enjoying those activities. I am aware by word of mouth, more than by direct experience, hearing the stories today of the life of giving, the life of generosity that marked his own so deeply. So Paul's words, the giver in generosity, ring so true for Dick's life. And I found out that he gave away more than I had imagined, a lot of trouble to his daughter and sisters, apparently. He gave away great generosity with his time in this community, beyond the church, to the Boys and Girls Club, to Girls Incorporated, to all sorts of organizations, including the Schenectady Community College. 
He was a giver of himself in humbleness. He did not draw attention to himself, but sought to build up others. He was a giver, as some of his friends knew, and those who were especially struggling knew in terms of financial, in terms of financial gifts. I've heard stories from Cindy and his children of the ways in which people who were really at the end of their rope received from him gifts that sustained their lives, gifts that helped them out of places of desperation, of addiction. Dick was an amazing giver. So we celebrate that today. We celebrate his generosity, his blessedness in that, the way in which he built up. And we also recognize that he was given much. His sisters can tell you, apparently, that he was treated like a prince at times in his family, being the youngest himself, given gifts by his family, undoubtedly by his mother and father. You know better than I, perhaps, the way he was given gifts by his beloved Cindy. Sure, he gave her a kitchen, but you have no idea, perhaps, unless you are the closest to the family, how much she gave to him in his final years, shepherding him along life's many paths. I watched them closely at a memorial service several years ago at St. Kateri Tekawitha, watched Cindy shepherd Dick to the places in the pew, through the reception line, making the connections for him when he was no longer able to make them himself. Dick was a great giver, generous of spirit, gave so much and was given so much. I don't know if you can read it, but here at the Lord's table, you can see his picture. The words underneath it read, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Dick was sustained by the bread of life all his days, receiving the sacrament of communion, the word proclaimed, baptized in the waters that gave life. And he is now with the Lord and giver of life in a way that we can only imagine, but can trust with all our hearts that the giver of all good gifts receives with joy the one who shared generously his life to the blessing of this world God loves. For the life of John Richard Philippi, thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord and giver of life, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, in hope, in love, now live eternally with you. We especially thank you for your servant, Dick. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all that in him that was good and kind and faithful, that was hilarious and playful and generous. We thank you for the grace that you gave to him, that kindled in him a love for you and others, all creatures great and small, and enabled him to serve you humbly, 
steadfastly, faithfully. We thank you that for Dick, death is past and pain and limitations are ended and that he has now entered the joy you have prepared through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we are bold to pray as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you, if you are able, to rise and sing hymn number 260, stanzas one and two. And I think it was this hymn that Cindy told me Dick and she sang along with Dick's father on their first foyer down to visit his parents in the car driving to the bus stop. So let us sing with full voice in honor of Dick and to God's glory. Verses one and two of hymn number 260.